Carlo, are you starting at nine, uh, six sharp? I am, yes. It's a 5.59, we're giving everybody one minute to file in. First of all, good evening, everybody. I haven't said hi to everybody. Carlo's the big boss. Okay, we're starting just like a few more seconds. Okay. Six o'clock sharp, we are starting. Good evening and uh, welcome to Dismantling Systemic Racism, a conversation organized by the uh, AIA Los Angeles 2 by 8 committee to discuss pressing issues of diversity, inclusivity and social justice, both in the school system and society at large. My name is Carlo Cacavale. I am the executive director for AIA Los Angeles. We have a really incredible panel to discuss this hot topic. But uh, uh, before we start, I would like to say that this conversation stems from this year's annual 2 by 8 exhibit and scholarship program entitled Domum, uh, which is Latin for house, which opened on November 5th and uh, that you can experience at 2 by 8org I want to give a shout out to the 2 by 8 committee led by Tatiana Sarkeesian and Kirill Wolczynski. Uh, they and the committee did a truly um, awesome job this year creating an engaging virtual experience and were able, <clears throat> were able to raise $30,000 that went back to students in scholarship during the opening ceremony. Now, just a couple of housekeeping. Please keep yourself muted, but feel free to use the chat to interact, post questions for the final Q&A. This event is being recorded and they're streaming live on our AIA Los Angeles YouTube channel and uh, the 2 by 8 Instagram account. And finally, if you lose your connection, just simply log back in. And now uh, to get this program started, I would like to introduce 2 by 8 committee co-vice co chair, <coughs> Chuck Nguyen. Chuck, take it away. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm co-vice chair of this year's 2 by 8 committee and this Two by Committee really continues its mission to recognize exceptional student work and which ranges from community colleges to postgraduate level. And the focus of our committee is to strongly on is strong on education. And we take these opportunities to bring some focus to our social environment, and which is a topic that our profession directly needs to work on. And while there is an assumption that our educational institutions are socially progressive, it's not always clear how they shape their agendas to be anti-racist and champion equality. So this event really serves as a public forum for the architecture programs present tonight um, to share with their communities how they will contribute to, in the efforts to dismantle systemic racism, and as well as provide a platform for the students of these institutions to ask questions and recognize what they're a part of. So tonight we have the chance to have nine programs joining us to present their plans to, com to combat systemic racism and seek social equality. Um, each school has sent a faculty representative to present a synopsis of that plan and a student representative who will be collecting comments and questions about their institutions from their peers. The nine schools will have six and a half minutes and they will be rotating in the following order. We'll start with Woodbury, followed by College of the Canyons, then CCA, and Cal Poly Pomona, followed by Cal State Long Beach, UCLA, ELAC, USC, and then we'll, final, uh, we'll end with, with Otis. After, after these schools have discussed their particular plans, we'll have the pleasure to hear from our guest, Bradford Grant, on the role of the HBCUs in eliminating racism and in teaching and learning. Then in the last 15 minutes, we'll have an open Q&A session for anyone to jump in. And please feel free to write your questions in the chat at any time before that. Our moderator tonight, Josh Foster, has a strong passion for creating community empowerment dri driven solutions. As an architectural designer, Josh focuses on affordable and market rate housing projects at KFA Architecture. While 
advocating for diversity as a SoCal NOMA executive board member and co-chair of the joint AIALA and SoCal NOMA JADA committee. Um, Josh, take it away. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us here today. Um, and I will do my best to do as little speaking as possible so that all of these amazing panelists, the faculty, the students, um, and hearing your voice as well um, for these Q&As. Um, and so without further ado, we, we will get started. Um, so as Chuck mentioned, we're gonna get started with Woodbury. Um, and as, as we get started with that, we also have the opportunity to have Khan Muhammad. Um, he is uh, the student rep for Woodbury today, but he is also the student board member for the SoCal NOMA chapter. Um, and he's gonna talk a little bit about um, the SoCal NOMA's university and college's DEI challenge. Um, and then as he get finished up with that himself, and then also Ingalu Walrus Ritter, she is the Dean of uh, the School of Architecture there at Woodbury. Um, and then she is gonna be talking about a synopsis of what, what they're doing um, at, at Woodbury and Khan will ask some questions back and forth taken from the students. Uh, so Khan, you can take it away. Thanks, Josh. So as Josh said, my name's Khan Mohammed. Uh, I'm the student board member for SoCal NOMA, and I'd like to present all of you the SoCal NOMA School, College, and University DEI Challenge. The DEI College and University Challenge promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion, offering principles and actions that will steer institutions towards creating a more inclusive experience for students of color and underrepresented groups. The challenge promotes access, equity, and equity in architecture education with 16 action points and 160 potential points to affect positive change and create positive cultural uh, inclusion. The 16, the 16 points follow these themes, recruitment, institutional culture, curriculum, engagement, and connection. We're asking you to commit to fighting against racism and racial inequality within the institutions that teach architecture. Commit to the efforts to achieve all action items. Commit to increasing diversity of the profession and commit to creating more equitable and inclusive architectural experience for all. It works pretty simply with voluntary reporting and an annual diversity survey and a maximum of six 160 uh, points. By achieving a 120 point ranking, you will be acknowledged by SoCal NOMA and NOMA as a DEI ally. If this sounds interesting and if you want to pledge, the next steps would be to email your, your pledge to SoCal NOMA at the DEI challenge cu at socalnoma.org. You could find those forms on the website, socalnoma.org. Once you do this, SoCalNOMA will happily provide you with resources and references in order to help you, um, assist you throughout making these action items. This is the SoCalNOMA DEI Challenge, and we hope that you join us and the many other schools across Southern California that have already accepted the pledge. And now I pass it off to Inglo. Thank you, Khan. Um, it's so inspiring to have you as a student at Woodbury. So um, let me kick this off here. This is uh, Khan and I will be presenting uh, the Woodbury School of Architecture uh, action plan. So at Woodbury, we believe that architecture has the revolutionary potential to transform society into one that's more just and equitable. But in order to achieve its transformative possibilities, change needs to happen. In 2013, we began a process to increase participation of individuals from groups that have been underrepresented and underserved in higher education and in the profession. In 2020, we renamed our DEI committee, the Design Justice Committee and recrafted our action plan to include four goals. Number one, speak up for change, fostering a total environment of respect, including publishing data, build new pathways, crafting pathways to guarantee access, opportunity and advancement, Diversify teaching and scholarship for a more inclusive pedagogy and reconstructing educational process. 
and four, promote economic justice to eliminate economic barriers that have prevented the full participation of underrepresented groups. So here are some projects that we've implemented. And uh, as part of our first goal, amplifying student voices, I've invited Khan to participate in these with me. And so we start off with one, speak up for change. We do this by being visible, by publishing the stories of our students and alumni through our monthly newsletters. Woodbury and the Woodbury School of Architecture has a long history as a champion of social justice. Leading by example, these are the current leaders that demonstrate our values publicly. They are appointed by me. And this is my amazing group of colleagues, Heather Flood, Lara Hode, Jose Parral, Mark Erickson, Aaron Gensler, and Sean Joyner, the leaders of Woodbury School of Architecture. By empowering students as the future leaders, we secure a legacy of um, agency within the School of Architecture. Mentoring students and alumni. These are two of our alumni, Sean Joyner, who's been mentoring another alumnus, Damar Matthews. Uh, Sean Joyner is now special projects coordinator who's also launching an alumni student mentorship program. Reaching out uh, summer high school programs by offering summer high school programs that are free offer college credit and partnering with LAUSD and NOMAS to encourage students to attend. Um, helps us build that pipeline for new blood. Create Pathways. This is our LAUSD partner, STEM Academy of Hollywood. It's a mentorship program where our alumni are mentoring high school students. We received a national award for this uh, program. There's Heather Flood and Catherine Roussel who are the leaders of this. Promote civic engagement. We established ACE 10 years ago um, and hosted, ho hosted design build studios every year working with nonprofits in Pacoima, Watts, Pico Union, and other underserved communities. Teaching students to teach. This is Jermaine Barnes. He's part of my advisory board. He's a, actually an instructor at University of Miami. And, and as City College New York Dean Leslie Loco stated, it's not our job to go out and find Black architects. It's our job to make them. This is a project that takes two generations. So Jermaine has challenged us to actively cultivate alumni by launching a post-professional program focused on teaching. We build community. Our San Diego campus is in a cultural district significant to Chicano history, 17 miles from the border where every studio project is focused on communities of color. Engaging the real world. These are our, our students working in Tijuana. This is the CLEAD, our Latin American student organization. Redefine practice. And uh, by offering new programs such as applied computer science, uh, applied computer science, media and arts, sustainable practices, construction management, and diversity of disciplines, new perspectives, and speculating about the future of the practice. Championing social justice uh, initiatives. Last year, our, we had a year of housing plus as our year long initiative where all students and studios faculty were focusing on this issue diversifying teaching and the year of climate uh, justice. Faculty grants um, to reward curricula um, and invite BIPOC speakers for a lecture series. Promote economic justice, the social justice scholarships that we started awarding last year. We have a $10,000 student competition coming up in the spring and partnerships with AIA San Fernando Valley and many other economic uh, sponsored studios and cultivate allies and partners. Our NOMAS chapter roundtable Spaces of Resistance was sponsored by 30 firms. And the AILA, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and finally, change the narrative. Asterisk, this is our student uh, run uh, group that aims to provide a space to dissect topics and instigate conversations that have been overlooked in core curriculum classes. We have to build a curriculum worthy of our students. One of the authors of this is actually on, I saw her in the audience. So Karin, thank you for everything that you're doing. So Khan, take it away. So on behalf of the architecture student body, I'd like to start by asking, what do you, when do you plan on adding faculty of color? So this is a painful question. Um, we clearly need to do more and better. 
Uh, so when Khan and I met yesterday, we I recognized that we have not messaged well enough in COVID time that we have in fact hired several uh, faculty of color, but that message has to get out more. We're a Hispanic serving institution. Our students want faculty with different perspectives. There's no question. Our San Diego program has 38% uh, BIPOC faculty, a much better ratio than our Los Angeles fac faculty where 20% of our faculty are BIPOC. So we definitely need to do more and better. These are the steps that we're taking moving forward. We have three full-time faculty searches and every faculty search has a job description that states that we seek candidates whose scholarship, creative work and research addresses the lives, experiences and cultural traditions of black indigenous communities of color, thereby expanding both access and authorship with underrepresented groups. I mentioned the leadership appointments. Our chairs are hiring BIPOC adjuncts. Our alumni are a powerful source of talent, faculty, jurors, mentors, and we need accountability in forums such as this one. That's great. The second question is, how will you keep up the momentum with students and future students? This is a, a, a good question because there's so much urgency right now and how do we make sure that we maintain it? Um, we've just rewritten our studio culture policy, cultivating a culture that values and empowers students. We have a new student leadership council with directors and the chairs and I meeting regularly with students and that's gonna continue. We have student representatives on many uh, newly appointed to many of our committees and we're paying them for that service. Some steps we've taken, we are financially supporting student organizations. That's now permanently in our, our program budgets. We're cultivating leadership opportunities such as uh, our No Must Chapter Roundtable and amplifying student voices. Succession plans are typically led by students. Can this be less organic and more structural? So it really is a strengthening of partnership between students, faculty, administrators, uh, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Woodbury. Um, this is a, a great start. Um, and we're looking forward to, to seeing all of, all, all of the things you have planned um, moving forward. Um, and so we will jump right into our next school. Um, so we have College of the Canyons. Um, they will be represented by Jason Oliver, who is the Chair of Architecture and Interior Design Program, and also Sierra Asbury, who is a current student. Great, thank you, Joshua. Um, hi, everybody, hope you're doing well. Um, so about six months ago, College of the Canyons um, adopted a joint resolution between our student government and our board of trustees uh, in solidarity of supporting minority students and racial injustice. Um, but one of the things that I found with a lot of these kind of resolutions is that, you know, at an institution the size of ours with you know, almost 30,000 students, this kind of resolution as far as finding its way into action down, you know, sort of boots on the ground level is, is a little bit difficult in, uh, in an institution like ours. So personally, I mean, I've found that the last couple of years and obviously particularly 2020 is, has brought to the surface a lot of, of self-reflection for myself. Um, how can we redirect the institutional momentum that's built into our program, you know, even becoming aware of it in the first place. Um, and how do we make change, you know, and change obviously takes courage because with change, there's inevitability, uh, uncertainty, um, and it obviously takes effort, which is, you know, as we know, is probably one of the hardest things for people. So when our program was uh, invited to participate in this event as part of the two by eight exhibit, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was just sort of take a pulse of our students, you know? So we started with a 20 question survey that we broadcast out in early October uh, to both the students and the faculty. And if nothing more, it was just to kind of get a discussion started to get some reaction and just sort of begin an exploration and see where it goes. So from that, over the last couple of weeks, what we've started to do is for our specific program is develop a draft plan of action, um, which I'm gonna share on the screen here. and. This is our, our kind of one page blueprint, if you will, um, that we're going to obviously evolve and improve upon, but it's gonna help guide us in, in ways that we can start to remove the sort of systemic discrimination and the inequalities from our program. Because um, 
throughout academia, throughout our society as a whole, there's a lot of inequalities and we see it as faculty and as, you know, sort of program administrators on a daily basis. It's the students that can't afford the textbooks or they don't have a computer at a student today um, who wasn't able to come to class for three weeks because their internet at, at home went out. So finding uh, ways to help those students out uh, is a great way towards, um, you know, moving in this direction. Um, I, th I think it was really important for us to first establish why we're going to be um, moving forward with the plan of action, because we have to sort of sell a narrative to people, you know, and it's not just enough to kind of go through the technical, the technicalities of how we're going to implement it, but why are we doing this in the first place? And um, for myself, it was really about making sure that we could support all of our students, uh, that they all felt appreciated and that they all thrived. And um, the the sort of details of how we implement that, of course, is, is a much more technical thing, but um, this plan of action, I think, uh, kind of sets us on a trajectory towards doing that. So first thing was becoming aware of uh, the communities around us. And, you know, so we can obviously pull sort of statistical demographic, um, demographic info on our students, but it's going to be a, a bit more qualitative than that. So we've actually held our first kind of town hall meeting with students and faculty. And that's something that we're gonna to try to do at least probably twice a semester to have a forum for discussion and also to get to know people on a much more personal uh, basis. Um, it's important that we communicate this plan to students that it's not just a document that gets kind of filed away and you know doesn't get acted upon, but it's something that is in all of our syllabi, all of our communication to the you know student body and to the outside world that this is something that we are uh, actively working on and are actively cognizant about um, for any kind of decisions that we make. Um, and I think very much, very similar to what Woodbury is doing, a lot of it uh, revolves around uh, culturally responsive teaching practices. So introducing students to these diverse narratives that are in many ways all around us, but they don't get singled out, they don't get highlighted, and they don't get supported academically in the way that they should. And so they don't gain the traction that some of the the sort of you know uh, broader, uh, more popularized narratives do, um, and I think then the last thing, uh, this last part about recruiting is kind of an interesting one. Um, I actually asked some uh, administrators uh, just the other day about the technicalities about how do we go about hiring somebody um, like proactively that is representing a underrepresented part of our student body. Well, of course, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of Proposition 16 and kind of, you know, what's been going on politically. But, um, you know, one of the things they said is that, you know, obviously we can't do anything to favor any particular group, but, but we can um, have certain requirements in our hiring practices so that somebody that we hire, you know, is effective and fluent in culturally responsive teaching. So I think that's, that's one way that we can definitely uh, from the sort of hiring and uh, representation standpoint really help our students out. So that's kind of where we're at as far as a, a snapshot of College of the Canyons uh, plan for removing systemic uh, discrimination and uh, inequality. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Jason. Hi, I'm Ciara. I'll be the student rep for College of the Canyons. Um, so I guess based off our own studies and just who I've asked as far as when it comes to questions, um, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers we have to overcome when it comes to race and education for our school? I think, I think a lot of it revolves around uh, being able to tell the story of success. You know, um, there's, there's a slogan that if you don't see it, you can't be it. And I think that our students need to see success and whether it's alumni of ours that are from a broad range of, of backgrounds, you know, ethnicities, sexual orientations, you know, economic footprints, what have you, that they can see how these people were in the same situation and they've become successful, you know, academically and professionally. So I think that number one is just uh, expanding the, the narratives of success for our students is an important thing. Sounds good. Um, and then our final question would be, who are we going to be holding accountable when we feel that diversity is not being represented at the school? Well, it starts with me <laughs> as the uh, program representative. Um, I, I, you know, 
we are a large institution and I think it's unfortunate that in bureaucracies, there's always a tendency to be able to kind of hide in the bureaucracy. Um, but as myself, as the department chair is kind of the face of our program, um, you know, I, I very much want to be held accountable. You know, I'm, obviously there's a larger uh, campus infrastructure that's, that's actively uh, looking to address these issues. But I think as far as our corner of the world at College of the Canyons, you know, myself and the faculty, we're the ones that are uh, the ones that are going to be um, actively implementing this in the classroom, and then you know, you know, including the students in the dialogue and very much in the decision making process to to guide this going forward. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you both very much. Thank you. So we will move along to our next school. Um, and so up next, we have CCA, California College of the Arts, um, and representing is the Chair of Architecture, Keith Crumwitty, um, and then also current student, Arturo Gomez Escobedo. And so take it away, guys. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, and thanks to AIALA and the 2 by 8 Committee for convening this conversation. Uh, clearly, this is time of reckoning for each of us as individuals, but also for the disciplines and institutions whose resources and power have too frequently been used in the service of maintaining unjust and unequal systems. Architecture is a product of the ideologies of those who conceive it and for whom it's built. And throughout history, architects and designers have been bound in service to the privileged and the powerful. As such, architecture has often been a tool of oppression rather than one of liberation. And it's long past time that we reconsider who and what interest we serve. Transformation in architecture must begin with schools of architecture, including ours here at CCA. We have a moral duty and responsibility as educators to actively advance the cause of racial justice and to fight against racism and all forms of discrimination and marginalization in our pedagogies and our practices. At CCA, we pledge to build upon and support the work of our faculty and students and alumni to foreground unheard, marginalized, and willfully suppressed histories and stories, and to craft tools through which these voices can be heard and represented in our community and in our design and scholarship. At CCA, we are committed to a pedagogy that prepares our students to be active agents through design, policy, and political action in imagining and building a just and equitable society, and to the ongoing work of building and sustaining a community that is diverse, inclusive, and anti-racist. To that end, we are working with the students, faculty, and alumni to identify and pursue concrete actions, both in our division and across the college to counter racism, bias, and all forms of implicit and explicit discrimination. I arrived at CCA two years ago, and I was thrilled to join a community committed to creative practice as a form of active social and political action. For many years, the architecture division at CCA has been engaged in connecting architectural education to the issues and concerns of the world beyond the walls of the school. From community engagement as a core element of studio pedagogy to globalizing architectural history and connecting histories of architecture to social and political context and concerns, to convening symposia and conferences like Reckoning, Monuments and Racial History, which was held the first semester I arrived at the school that focused on pressing issues of the day. But in this moment, it's clear that there's much more work we need to do. This year in all of our programs, we began the work of constructing an, an anti-racist, justice-oriented culture with corresponding curricula. We recognize that this work will take time, but are committed to immediate action. As such, the faculty in all of our programs are working together to rebuild the canon, to bring in stories that have been marginalized, stories that have been disregarded, um, voices that have produced a rich range of forms and practices uh, means of organizing the world and constructing relationships um, to constructing new teaching methodologies, developing uh, review formats where we have peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And some of this have been certainly supported and precipitated by the COVID virtualization of our pedagogy. Um, and to prioritizing in our pedagogy, the lived experience and embodied knowledge of our students. This is work that's ongoing. We recognize that frankly, and I think as Ingelo pointed out earlier, this is generational work that needs to happen. Um, architecture has been a domain of uh, almost by definition, whiteness, 
um, since its founding. Um, and certainly the pedagogies uh, through which has been promoted, disseminated, and preached uh, have reinforced that whiteness. Uh, and there's work that we are really committed to doing here to look at ourselves, um, to look at the systems we propagate, to look at the knowledge that we, I think in some cases regurgitate without really reflecting upon what it means, um, what knowledge systems and practices and intelligence is uh, excluded in the propagation of those practices um, and to rebuild uh, really who we are and what we do and to ask our students to join us in that. We began in the summer um, with some town halls where we brought the students together, we brought faculty together to really just analyze ourselves, put ourselves on the couch. And then at the end of the summer, right before the start of the term, we held a faculty retreat, which was focused on constructing an anti-racist pedagogy. We brought in consultants from uh, other colleagues at the college here at CCA. We have a group called the Decolonial School. We asked them to come and join us tell us a little bit about the work that they've been doing for the last year and a half. Um, we brought in partners um, from the diversity steering group at the college level with administrators to think about you know, ways that we can, not just in our curricula, but looking forward, um, how do we diversify our faculty? How do we construct hiring systems where we can actually bring in um, bodies that actually can serve as role models for our very diverse student body? Um, CCA, the last report I saw is one of the most diverse colleges in the country, not just art schools, but colleges at large. Um, but our faculty, I will say in architecture does not represent our student body and it needs to represent our student body. So that's something going forward that I'm committed to. Um, times right now make it difficult, um, but we are looking forward several years to a hiring situation where we can begin to do that. We are doing that now with our adjunct faculty looking to actually um, put teachers in front of students that the students can see themselves in, um, which is really important. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop and, and uh, talk to Arturo um, and see what questions he has for us. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Luis Arturo Gomez Escobedo and I'm the president here at CCA, California College of the Arts um, for the CCA NOMAS chapter. Um, I think one of the questions that it was brought up um, from gathering information with our students, uh, the student body seems to be really um, satisfied and feels really supported of the school and there's something not to be surprised of because the support and the, com the commitment that they have as like faculty, it's really amazing and like throughout the entire semester, there has been meetings and there has been spaces for us to actually go and ask questions and bring our discomfort and bring our thoughts out to the table, which is really important to do so, especially in these times. Um, I think that the bigger question that we have been addressing since we have a structure that kind of has been working and it's still working on our favor on both sides, I think, um, it's how do we efficiently um, make spaces for some of these conversations and discomforts? Um, I think la yesterday on a conversation that Keith and I had, um, it was proposing multiple ideas and we actually went in depth with just like the idea of how does this spaces or, or this virtual setup actually look like. Um, and I think one of the highlights, it was that we, or at least in my side, it's like, all right, you know, the spaces are always provided, but we have to understand that we are as a CC, like, like the CCA architecture department. We have in the architecture, it's a culture that is like a lot of work. And it, it, there's a culture of overwhelming of just like with the tons of stress sometimes or just high levels of pressure to try to keep your project moving forward. And we actually prioritize that, which is really good. But I think one of the, the things that it was sort of like proposed in the conversation, it was the idea of bringing that part, uh, like bringing those conversations as part of the curriculum, having a day to pause and actually reflect within the actual class or studio environment with your peers. It might be this, like it might be uncomfortable at first, but by having those structures, it would actually help us to start these conversations, to build these conversations. And even moving forward, I think it's kind of a, like 
how do we actually embrace that to a new studio culture to actually host these conversations? We will be stepping outside these walls, these studios to address some of the biggest world's issues. And we need to start doing things inside first. We need to be able to have these conversations in this dialogue here, like within the studio environment. Um, and I think the question for Keith, it would be like, how would that look like within the next coming up years? I think it's really important to recognize that there is always a transition and there's always steps to it. So the, it, it's always, we have to be aware in both parties from the faculty side and the student side that there are steps that must be taken. And the, the fact that these initiatives and these conversations are being brought up is already a win for both sides. Um, but if Keith, if you have any thoughts? Or I think <clears throat> I, was, I was really um, sort of impressed yesterday when Arturo and I spoke and, and he foregrounded something that I think it's easy to lose sight of in, in architectural and design education um, work is value to a degree that um, I think undermines uh, the care that is a necessary part of, I think, everything we're talking about. Constructing an environment where we recognize self-care, mutual care, collective care as central, really, to, um, I think, what we're talking about when we're talking about justice, a justice-oriented pedagogy. Um, I don't have immediate answers. I mean, one is to actually make that care, in fact, part of the, the culture of teaching, which means to bring it into pedagogy. A danger, I think, of that is that you just, like, that becomes work. Um, so for us, it's, you know, what are the spaces we can create? And really, we're talking about space and time more than we're talking about physical or virtual space to meet, right? We're actually, like, how do we carve out time that, um, makes it possible for us to actually concern ourselves with one another and concern ourselves with the, the needs and the desires of, of one another as people and to see each other as people with particular identities, particular concerns. Um, and so I think part of that is maybe thinking about the premiation of work as a value within the, like just labor as a value within the field, right? Like it's very often like, you know, you just need to work harder. Faculty will tell their students. I think classmates will tell each other. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure what that looks like on the ground in the studio or on the screen in the studio these days. Um, part of it, I think, is actually bringing that kind of philosophy into the framing of the problems that we that we put in front of students. Um, uh, maybe recalibrating what we what, how we assign value to work like the qual like you know qualitative value to work um it's it's an ongoing concern and it's certainly something that the faculty is talking about here i think a big part of it is actually like recognizing students as the best critics in in a community and design community right and, and and i think that's also an amazing thing because we have actually seen the action taken from the faculty side which is that's kind of the, the conversation was driven into, it was the fact that we are like the faculty and, and staff and even student leaders, we're hosting these spaces to have this conversation, but yet students are finding a hard time coming to it because it's in a virtual setup. We have studio, we have work, and it, it's just like prioritizing the conversation. Do I do my drawings for next class or do I go to a discussion about racial inequality? Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, people prioritize having a better grade than that. So that's why the introduction and the idea was like, maybe we bring it up to the studio environment and allowing the studio to address some of the issues internally and then step out, out of our doors to local communities and sort of like starting to address those issues to feel everybody, to make everybody feel welcome um, and to create a system that allows all of us to actually be involved in addressing these issues not just through our dialogue, but also through actions. Thank you both very much. Very, very great points brought up there. Um, we Thank want you. to move on to the next school. And so up next we have Cal Poly Pomona. And so representing the School of Architecture, we have professor and advisor for the NOMIS chapter, Irma Ramirez, and a current student, Henry True. 
Great, thank you, everyone. Um, it is it is just absolutely great to see this kind of support. Um, you know, when I was a student, it, you know, uh, I I think we all wish that there was this uh, amazing dialogue going on. And at many times, I think you know, much more of a struggle to you know for for these issues to be accepted at this level of uh, of discussion of the profession. Um, at Cal Poly Pomona, I will say that, you know, we are committed to diversity and inclusion. Uh, to just highlight a few numbers, we have 40% of our architecture students are uh, Latino, 24% uh, are Asian, uh, but only 2% are African American. Uh, we are very fortunate that the university supports the mission. It is absolutely a priority of Cal Poly Pomona as an institution to deal with uh, systemic uh, racism and to um, exercise inclusion in all of our practices. Um, in the area of recruitment and community outreach and engagement, <clears throat> Um, we have been incredibly successful, led by our students this year, uh, to form uh, a NOMAS chapter that, uh, in just a few uh, in just a few months, was able to reach 40 members. So we know that this that this is an initiative that the students are asking for, and I know that they are the ones that um, are going to keep us accountable. Uh, there are uh, efforts also uh, by uh, our NOMAS chapter on the in the areas of um, uh, scholarships. And uh, we are also leading initiatives to open discussions with um, engaging uh, school districts. Uh, also, like, uh, like many other of your campuses as uh, pipelines uh, into our programs. Um, <clears throat> in the area of um, institutional uh, culture, uh, we did kick off the fall semester uh, with extensive speakers at the university level on the issue of diversity and, in and inclusion. Uh, we know we we are looking to uh, for these to actually become um, a uh, a ritual every term and also to be implemented widely even at the level of uh, being required. Uh, so among them uh, we had Dr. Robin um, Johnson who led an amazing session on in, on uh, inclusive leadership and dealing with conflict and microaggressions. Um, specifically for me, that was an incredibly enlightened discussion, and I I, I will say that as as um, as great as it was to sit there, I also recognize that many, um, uh, many of us that were there was, uh, you know, because of personal interest or uh, voluntary. And I kept thinking that it should be something that all of us at the institution should be exposed on, exposed to. Uh, as many others, we also have a required Title IX training for all students and faculty. It has been disheartening this year to see this uh, deteriorate at the federal level to take um, a hit at the, you know, in terms of how, how, how um, much this can be implemented, but we look uh, forward to a better, um, a brighter future um, on that ground as well. We actively do engage uh, in inclusive hiring strategies. And this is again, an initiative of the university uh, as they are committed to this effort. They provide financial support uh, for um, our department when we when we have specifically tenure track uh, positions um, that we we can actually utilize funding to reach out uh, to minorities in the profession. Uh, we continually uh, reach out through uh, NOMAS networks um, uh, for tenure track positions and we have uh, been successful um, in the spring. Actually, we had a, a successful hire coming from these um, initiatives. <clears throat> Currently, we're also discussing um, adjunct positions with people that include minority professionals, um, and we look forward to, to having uh, results from that <clears throat> soon. At the level of curriculum, uh, we have uh, faculty that informally have already began course content uh, adjustments in response to many of the principles raised by DEI independent efforts in the area of history, design studio, and community practicum courses are underway, some of them already established for a few um, years. Um, many of them similar to many that um, have been mentioned, so I've, maybe just to be brief, I won't go into some specific examples. Um, in the area of engagement, of course, you know, I just um, spoke about our NOMAS chapter. We are um, absolutely led by them at this point and by their enthusiasm. Uh, they are, uh, they have become a part of our faculty meetings and they are in discussions with us to update, uh, the, well, certainly to implement the DE challenge, but also to update our studio policy to, um, to be inclusive uh, specifically of this, um, of this challenge. 
So uh, with that, I'll uh, pass it on to Henry. Hi everyone, my name is Henry and I am the president of CPP NOMAS. Uh, I will be representing uh, Cal Poly Pomona um, by bringing some questions from the students today. Um, so Irma, CPP was just ranked number two uh, nationwide in the number of Hispanic students receiving a BARC degree. Uh, as one of the leaders in diversity on campus, um, what is Cal Poly doing to combat the slow incline of Black and African American professionals in the field? The current percentage is about 2% for Black men and about 0.3% for Black women. Yes, this is a, uh, a particular challenge. I think for the profession in general, we recognize that. Uh, for Cal Poly Pomona Architecture Department, we have uh, a double challenge in that we have an impacted program, which actually limits our enrollment in, um, in very severe ways. And so we really kind of have to get creative as to how we do that. Uh, we are though um, a, currently in discussions, you know, for example, one of the, uh, one of the uh, examples that I can mention, we're currently um, actually just today had a great meeting uh, with Compton Unified Dis School District um, as an initiative for us to uh, also create a, a pipeline and uh, potentially even a signature program um, that, can, that can host uh, students onto our campus. Um, other examples, we have community engagement courses. One of them was a, um, a course uh, working with Augustus Hawkins High School in South LA, working on a healthy Los Angeles project where CPP students um, a collaborated with Hawkins students at uh, Augustus Hawkins uh, as a means to show uh, young students what architecture is. And as a matter of fact, that was a program that started uh, initially, we thought it was for 12th graders. And when we arrived, we realized it was ninth graders. And after getting over the panic of what a ninth grade you know, could, could expect, we realized that that is actually where we need to be reaching much earlier. Uh, even actually before um, high school. So that is uh, a priority of our college. Um, our dean is incredibly supportive of that. And, um, and I actually wanna mention one of the initiatives that um, our NOMAS chapter has uh, is leading and that we're discussing with them. I'm gonna pass it on to, to Henry because we're thinking that perhaps from some of these efforts reaching out to uh, school districts like Compton uh, School District that maybe you know, this, um, uh, these uh, summer initiatives could be possible. What do you think, Henry? Yeah, so when I was first introduced to NOMA, um, I, I uh, was introduced to Project Pipeline. And the Project Pipeline has been um, basically one of the main drivers for our success. We have we, we went from seven members to about 80 members in just three months. And like most of our, most of our students are just super excited about this project pipelines because um, we feel like, you know, we need to join the efforts to foster the next generation to, to make architecture more inclusive. Um, we started a program um, that's much, very closely aligns with uh, uh, ACLA, uh, which is started by uh, um, AIALA. Um, Basically, CPP NOMAS uh, recently established a committee to assist SoCal NOMA with uh, summer camp and boot camp. Um, we're assisting the ENV department with that committee with uh, outreach in underprivileged areas, and our members are also participating as mentors in our summer bridge and introductory program for high schools and community college students. In addition to that, we are also in the process of establishing a crowdfund to offer foundational scholarships to these prospects. It will be structured much, uh, much like our CPP NOMAS uh, scholarship, uh, a scholarship fund that was started by the students for the students, uh, because we at CPP NOMAS feel like it's just as much our responsibility uh, as students to foster the youth for the betterment of uh, future arch architecture. And yeah, and with that, I think we're out of time. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Another uh, another great set of points and discussions. Looking forward to being able to talk a bit more once the Q&A rolls around. Um, so up next, we're gonna move forward with Cal State Long Beach. Um, and so representing Cal State Long Beach, we have the professor and program coordinator of interior design, Eduardo Perez, um, as well as a current student, Jennifer Hicks. So Thank we're gonna start off by introducing no. Jennifer oh. Hicks because <laughs> We're an interiors program, so we kind of like like to hit you from the left side, kind of the inside out. So we're flipping the scheme on everybody. So 
Jennifer, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Ed. And I also want to say thank you to everybody that has already reached out in the chat to help me get a NOMA chapter started at our campus. This is a really awesome group and I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'll get started. Uh, we are very fortunate that we live in Long Beach. It's an extremely progressive city and the Cal State Academic Senate Executive Committee along with our campus president, Jane Canali, have been quite open and vocal on their position and standing in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. They have pledged to move towards racial justice, uh, pledged to work towards racial justice and against anti-Blackness at Cal State Long Beach. And we recognize that for most of its existence, the Academic Senate has been led by white professors and the Senate at Cal State Long Beach has been a predominantly white institution. So we've made it our goal to work together to change the existing inequitable frameworks and structures within the institution. And we've identified several ways that we can begin this process. So first of all, we recognize that we need to work on ourselves. The Senate Exec Committee is actively participating in a series of trainings through the California Conference for Equity and Justice so that we can better understand the systemic inequities of our institution and limit unconscious biases and exclusionary practices that are in place now. And we also need to work on educating our citizens with an accurate history of how anti-Blackness came to be. So we're working with our ethnic studies faculty leaders and colleagues on campus and in the CSU more broadly to implement an ethnic studies general education requirement course, you know, as part of the California Bill 1460. And we're working to change our hiring practice. This is something I heard a lot of the other schools talk about. It's unfortunately Prop 16 didn't pass, but as someone else mentioned, there's other things that we can do. Um, we want to propose the inclusion of an equity advisor in all of our search committees. And moving forward, the Senate has pledged to include administrators work towards racial justice as a category to be evaluated during the hiring process. And access and retention of and for our Black, Indigenous, and students of color is also imperative. Our plan of action really must go beyond the walls of our university and come in the form of out outreach to the local high schools and junior high schools in our area because we need to reach students before they get to the level of higher education. The problem at our school is not that students of color are not being admitted into the program, it's that they don't even apply in the first place. So we are going to continue to disaggregate admissions and retention data for black students with the goal of interrogating and remedying inequities in black student access and retention at Cal State Long Beach. And then we hope that these inequities will be analyzed by each of the colleges within our institution at the undergraduate and graduate levels to determine why Black students withdraw or from our programs or why they choose to persist at Cal State Long Beach. And we'll ask the colleges within our institutions to link these findings from this project to a diversity action plan for access and retention so that we ensure that our local partners are representative of schools and districts from which we want to recruit black students. So I know that was a mouthful. <laughs> I am going to move ahead and ask Ed some of the questions that came from our student body. Um, one of the concerns was what are some programs that promote racial justice and social justice on campus? Um, so Ed. <clears throat> one of the things is that we're, we're a small program within a large university and the largest you know, system, university system in the United States. So there's different levels of kind of politics that we have to go to, but we're the little program that can, we're, we're very much, very much kind of the dog, the, the tail wagging the dog in many times. So, so we're kind of, you know, we're, we're out there on, on the front lines, if you will. And you can see that we empower our students, such as Jennifer Hicks, we value their voices. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to turn this around a little bit as well, too. Uh, we value everything that they say and we listen. We listen. We just don't hear. We listen. But some of the things that 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 are going on campus, university wise, and we're really trying to make it very much of a focus, you know, within our program is that the CSU, the CSU will be Center for Health and, and Equity Research is constantly in an effort to engage students to get involved in the fight against racial inequality for providing up to date resources and opportunities for students to fight inequality themselves through their website, which is readily, readily accessible to everybody. And really everybody on campus knows about this. I mean, as, as Jennifer has, has stated, our president is, is, is such a champion for this cause. And you know, we're so grateful for having her there. 
that um, the advocate for specific cases and policies, we can act upon things such as related to the, obviously the George Floyd situation, Breonna Taylor, and the list goes on and on and on as we know, unfortunately, and it kind of continues to, to continue with that, sadly, but true. But we, we have, we have the, 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 the pieces, if you will, in place. Now it takes us as well as a program with the next program, our neighbors, and getting everybody involved with this. And once again, you know, being designers, I mean, I think we, we have very little filters. So we, we are heard in the university. And, but like I said, it, it, it's challenging through the different protocols that we have to go through, but, but we're fighters and we don't give up on that. Uh, I, I won't repeat a lot of the things that Jennifer said, but basically we have the systems in place for this. And I, we believe that we have an audience and we're gonna continue to champion this. And, and also I do hope that this is only part one of our dialogue amongst our colleagues here. I think it's, it's, such, it's such a great place to start. Maybe some that should have happened many moons ago, no doubt, but, but thank you all for being here. And, and it's just an honor to be here. Thank you, Ed. Um, another question from one of our students is, what is the school doing to help students of color feel safe on campus? So to, to add upon some of the aspects that we just kind of brushed upon, the Academic Senate Executive Committee has vowed to support the departments and programs that support Black students in several ways. They will support the institu institutionalization of funding for the Black graduation of the Black Students er Union more broadly. <clears throat> Excuse me. The campus has fully removed the prospect repeat statue, as many of you guys have known, that, that made it all throughout the news. And obviously it's very controversial. Don't know if the shark is the best one that we got, but regardless of that, we've moved on beyond prospect repeat and obviously the, the, the ties to, to that era um, and what it meant. Uh, the campus has, uh, excuse me, and, and once again, to show solidarity with the indigenous communities. Um, our indigenous history department is quite large and quite varied. Um, and we're trying to build stronger ties with obviously cross collaborations within our campus. That's, uh, that's one of the beauties of being a, mm -hmm. at a, such a large campus where we build ties with other departments. COVID, as we all know, has put a, has put a, a stop, a, you know, if, if not, you know, speed bumps to complete stops on a lot of trajectories that we're moving forward. But, we're hoping to reestablish some of those things and build upon some trajectories of moving some of these, these cross-platform you know, um, um, conversations and even getting it back into us, into the studios where we can now develop studio projects based off of not just our own yearnings within the, the, the building profession, but also with others that have no doubt very important impacts in our socioeconomic you know, aspects of where we're at today. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Uh, we have a Design Students Association. Um, Jennifer Hicks is very active in that as, very, as, as much of our other students are. And we're missing the town hall meetings that we used to have. These were very engaging town hall meetings where the, the intangibles came out, these, these small sidebar conversations, which meant so much that it's much more difficult to have in this age of kind of virtual communication. So there are no doubt a lot of five sensory aspects that are endemic to us as human beings that we're trying to kind of figure out how to do that virtually. Um, I, I don't think the, the bumps are that large that we can not overcome, but, but there's a bit of a paradigm shift as to how, to, how we continue with these things. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will be moving on to our next school um, and to keep things moving at a good pace, we're asking um, the rest of the schools, the students, if you can give your one best question to ask the faculty member, we're gonna go with that. And then once we get to the Q&A, there's more time we can kind of circle back around. Um, so up next we have UCLA. Um, they will be represented by the associate professor and vice chair, Kutan Ayata, as well as current student, Roya Chagnon. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, invitation. Um, really, to happy, I'm happy to participate in this conversation and this dialogue. Um, I think, needless to say, we're going through um, a seismic moment, uh, a moment we, which we can no longer ignore, uh, we can overlook. Um, we have to look at ourselves first and kind of redefine who we are. Um, and it needs to happen through. Um, conversations like this, sometimes difficult conversations. But at every moment of crisis, there's an opportunity for creativity. Uh, and I think that's something uh, that we want to keep in front of us at every step of the way when we ultimately are in a discipline to redefine the future reality of our world. Uh, 
uh, and hopefully uh, through these steps uh, for a better world than uh, that we were left with. Um, we are at a we are under a unique structure at UCLA as a, a Department of Architecture and uh, Urban Design. Uh, we are one of the four academic units uh, and three public units, including uh, Hummer Museum, Fowler Museum, uh, under School of Arts and Architecture. While this uh, kind of siloing uh, and autonomy uh, presents opportunities to um, kind of uh, have our way and explore. Through recent reflection, uh, we realize we siloed from one another to a point where uh, there, is, uh, there is no meaningful dialogue for interdisciplinary exchange and expansion of our uh, knowledge set. Um, this year in June, um, Dean Brett Steele assembled together uh, a AEDI commission uh, made from students, recent alumni, um, faculty, staff, administrators, uh, to begin to work to incorporate into the strategic planning of 2025 to take concrete steps uh, to change the culture of the school uh, for a better direction. Um, under this effort, we've been meeting every week um, and if through the commission, through subcommittees that uh, later expanded to um, kind of student representatives from departments, um, further lecturers, other faculty, that are not part of the commission uh, to brainstorm and seek what is it that we can do specifically. Um, we came up with, uh, with a vision uh, that I will share here uh, under three headings uh, in its uh, short format, which will be made public uh, in the coming weeks, uh, which is being presented to the vice chancellor uh, to set example for the university as a whole. Uh, and being integrated into the strategic plan. So it becomes uh, you know, a very concrete step in the way uh, we practice our teaching, we run our departments and we treat one another uh, in an environment of working and learning. Um, the vision is um, kind of, uh, organized under uh, three main topics, uh, training and professional development, structure, accountability, restoration and recruitment. Uh, and finally, curriculum. The initiatives and goals for training and professional development will raise awareness about the impacts of systemic racism on the personal, academic, and public lives of our school community and provide concrete tools to address and mitigate racist behavior and professional development opportunities, including mentorships and internships that foster community building and professional and creative growth for current, graduating, and prospective students from under-resourced and historically underrepresented communities. Initiatives and goals for structure, accountability, restoration and recruitment will change the school structure to establish and maintain protocols for accountability and transparency, such as anonymous methods of reporting, AEDI concerns, and well-defined methods of response. The subcommittee will identify and guide new methods for recruitment retention and promotion of BIPOC hires in faculty and administrative appointments, particularly in leadership positions. They will also make recommendations to prioritize ADI work in merit reviews and to distribute the work more equitably between white and BIPOC faculty. Finally, the initiatives and goals for curriculum seek to create a more culturally responsive learning environment by deconstructing Eurocentric and white suprematist academic models through more inclusive curricula and pedagogies. The goals seek to re-examine the origins and histories of prevailing discourses and canons, break down the hierarchies between faculty and students through collaborative curriculum development and research, and implement foundational cross-disciplinary course requirements that will operate between um, different departments under the school. The commission is gonna, going to be um, kind of continuing its work uh, as a as an agency to oversee the development and implementation of these, uh, of these uh, visions. Um, we are at a moment uh, where these set of goals uh, are being pushed down into the departments um, and um, the hard work starts now for us uh, to see uh, how these dreams, how these ambitions, uh, how these goals can be reached through um, kind of uh, work uh, that enables both students and faculty to work in collaboration uh, to see how we can transform uh, our environments, our curriculum, 
uh, and uh, our experience uh, within the universities. Um, I want to leave time for Roya uh, to get to her questions. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop right here. Hi everyone, I'm Roya. I'm a second year in the Master's of Architecture program at UCLA. I've been working with Kutan a lot on kind of these EDI efforts. Um, so I know that our time is short. I'm gonna try and cram a lot in here. Um, I just want, we collected a lot of great questions from the student body and I wanted to um, read one along with a, a comment from um, one of my peers in the program. Students and faculty of color are extremely underrepresented within the program. Um, I am one of what I know to be three African-American students in the student body with no African-American faculty. Coming from an undergraduate program that was extremely diverse, where people came from all types of backgrounds, to university in a city that's more diverse, yet the program is not, I find it kind of odd. So I just want to ask, um, why do you think that our department has failed to attract, hire, or admit underrepresented minorities. And as a public university, how can we ensure that we are serving um, the public as we're intended? Um, I think this is a this is a problem um, that we have to do better. Um, I think uh, our and as mentioned before, um, increased pipeline programs um, that deal um, directly with the local uh, high schools uh, in and around Los Angeles uh, could be the first direct step for us to engage and foster um, you know, young students to I think, cultivate an interest in architecture and begin to build relationships uh, with the university. Um, with our two summer programs, uh, we already engage them, uh, but I think our, re our outreach, not only through the School of Architecture, but also through the public units that happen that are under the School of Arts, uh, can have uh, more programs to draw from, uh, from the constituencies uh, within the city that, uh, that draw from BIPOC uh, representation. Um, and I think uh, in terms of how to give back to the community, um, you know, uh, I think this comes to uh, thinking new models of uh, uh, teaching within the studio uh, and how we can imagine you know, projects within the curriculum that can begin to uh, engage community uh, outside of the norms that uh, we have been uh, traditionally dealing with. Um, and I think some of the labs within the school that already begin to do this, uh, City Lab has a uh, outreach and uh, programs that deal directly with issues of zoning uh, within Los Angeles, uh, but also building prototypes uh, that deal with homelessness, uh, some of the uh, examples we have seen from recent years. Um, but having uh, said all this, uh, I, I don't think these are satisfying uh, moments to stop. Uh, we need to expand and try to do better uh, in our recruitment, both for uh, faculty uh, and students. If there's time for another question, I'll ask. But if we're short, <laughs> let us let's, let's, um, let's save it till the end. Thank you very much, though. That was a very good question and comment you had from the student there. Um, so to move forward, um, we're going to move on next to East Los Angeles College. Um, and representing ELAC is the chair of the Department of Architecture, Michael Hamner, and a current student, Stephen Curtis. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate this. And I thank everybody for allowing uh, East Los Angeles College to participate in this event. You know, when I was posed with the question about discussing dismantling systemic racism and pedagogy, you know, at an institution that's located in a community that's 96% Hispanic and itself is comprised of 97% minority enrollment, you know, one can, one can, you know, take a moment to pause. However, our college and, and, of course, my program or our program recognizes that the umbrella designation doesn't include all who identify as underrepresented populations. The, in, the, the unique nature, and it's, it's nice to see it, to have another counterpart here that's representing a two-year school and, and the uh, complexities that our programs, you know, I'm talking with College of the Canyons. Um, being a representative of community college on this panel, it needs to be noted that we're, we're a complex entity. Uh, we serve our community at many levels, uh, from vocational education to adult education, and offer community programs that some are not even academic in nature. And in terms of the college education, 
where does a community college fit in its true academic institution? For students that are wishing to break a cycle and commence a new trend, a community college either becomes a second chance or the only pathway to higher education. Recognizing that a lot of our students come from families where only 8% of these families have a degree, a bachelor's degree or greater, and only 50% even have a high school education. With that said, we don't choose our students. Our, our success is complicated by a series of factors that we have no control over. However, we need to, to provide equal investment in each one of our students and roles in our programs. Knowing much of that energy, we may be for not, at least initially, we, we, we invest in this because it's the right thing to do. And we don't know what the end game could be for a lot of these students who may pass through our doors and not stay with us. I'm setting this up because I'm talking about how a program like ELAC operates and hopefully through some of the, the data I can give you here in terms of our success, it establishes, uh, at least I hope, you know, uh, our methodology and how we're um, uh, meeting these needs of a diversity and inclusion. The Department of Architecture at ELAC is, is consciously recognized um, the complexity of our students' needs, their backgrounds, and their preparedness. We have served this evolving community for 75 years, and, and the Department of Architecture has been a part of the college since day one. When we delved into this specific topic, I was sincerely moved by the student responses to the dis dismantling systemic racism and pedagogy questionnaire that was posed to our students. I, 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 I'm looking at it right now and, and the ratings uh, were amazing and, 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 the, and uh, the feeling of our students in terms of, the, of our faculty representing them was, was uh, incredible. And to think about it consciously, we do not have or had not had a DEI program. So I got, on my, I got off my ass here and I, I, I put one together and I, I wanted to break it down very quickly. When I look at the terms diversity, equity and inclusion, I, I took the following diversity and I read I defined it from the community college and from ELAC's perspective acknowledging multiple identities in the classroom and the studio equity recognizing all and sharing the power of engagement inclusion ideas from all individuals matter and I added a component to that and I added belonging so with DEI if you do it right we create belonging which engage all individuals integrate all their values so I put that to our litmus test, our litmus test being, what have we done over the last few years? I've been at ELAC for 29 years. And over the last 14 years, I've been at the helm of this program. And what I've done is to try to manage our relationships with our students. So we, cre we, we created the data, so to speak, our, our uh, analytics. And we, we, we analyze our students and we, we stay in contact with them from the completion of our program as a transfer and even into their employment years. Over that 14 year period, we've had 350 students transfer from our program, averaging about 24 students a year. Almost 98 students percent of those students have graduated. And from my partners, the university partners that are here, um, you know what our students mean and what they represent and how they have have actually brought their culture in a positive sense to your programs. Prior to that, we were only averaging about five a year. So how did we do this? So here's the test. Number one, we make their engagement with our program personal. Partly due to my embedded life in East LA and my experiences, it's about respecting, understanding, and being empathetic to, uh, to their culture. After that, it becomes even simpler. We strengthen our design studios around the studio culture. I mean, all of our universities do this. The concept, we, in concept, and we utilize object-based learning as a means to connect with our students via their cultural knowledge and their prior experiences. This allows our students to take ownership in their learning. This is critical. In, in a community college, this is what happens. Many of our students are not even assessing at college level reading and math. We had to counsel our academic counselors to allow our students to enroll in our design courses with an understanding we will teach them how to learn on their own terms be, you know, via the contextualized learning. The contextualized learning methodology was augmented by a very important component that I believe our, our program is unique with, and that's the cognitive process. Unique maybe only for the fact that we talk about it. I'm a firm believer in the cognitive learning, the study of architecture, and the studio culture is a natural conduit for that. Learning how to learn strengthens critical thinking, and critical thinking is supported by process. Our process employs embodied cognition, 
which is a motor system influencing, influencing our cognition, and this becomes the ELAC learning cycle. When you think about where a lot of our kids are coming from, where math and science is not a strong suit, nor are they interested in it, nor is it something that their families may be uh, instilling in them. We need to teach come from a different place and their experiences in their life and their cultural knowledge becomes a great starting point for them to learn how to learn. When we simplify it, it's simply this, students are learning by doing. Our students enjoy learning by doing. We develop analog skills, which produces instantaneous results that is recognized and hence leads to confidence. So we started off with a really important term here and that was being personal and developing confidence through learning through their strengths. And yet, as our partners, university partners understand, our students come in with high critical thinking skills, a lot of uh, uh, obviously uh, graphic skills and communication skills, and they accumate, acu accumate, uh, what they do, they assimilate uh, very, uh, very seamlessly. That said, analog skills also will develop our digital skills. And as the digital becomes available to our students, it creates a stronger uh, benefit uh, and, and, and foundation. The point being is we can't hold our students back because they don't have access to the technology and digital in the beginning formative years and foundation years. And we find that to be a, an extreme case here in our community in East Los Angeles. And yet our students are still able to matriculate eventually. This translates to a success that is based on trust. So we've had being personal, developing confidence, and now we've based or we've created trust. When you empower your students with skills, there is a sincere relationship of integrity that leads to hope. Lastly, we engage. We engage our students oftentimes before they even enroll in our program. They contact us, we advise them. We maintain that engagement that extends past their graduation. Very common for our students to come back to our studios even while they're enrolled at the next level. During their times between studios or whatever it may be, they already wanna come back and give back. My background at USC with the Trojan Network, being in East Los Angeles, the Mi Familia concept in the, in the, in the Hispanic culture, it, 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 it comes together and it blends itself. And I don't have to push this. Our, our instructors don't push this. They do it on their own. We're also finding that we're having a large wave of, of former students wanting to come back and become adjunct instructors, which we are engaging with them and we're kind of hiring them. And then of course, we, we, students engage uh, us as, uh, with us and with our future students. So by making this personal, we teach skills that lead to confidence, sharing these skills and tools to create a level of trust that instills hope and in leading to engagement. And that's the cycle that repeats itself at East LA College. The final component that assists our students is pride. We believe we have reinvented the community college architecture program experience. Remember, we started with that. That's the foundation of where our students learn. They bring in an experience. They may not be, they may not have the academic acumen, but they come in with a lot of experience. And when we create an experience for them, it enhances their, their learning component. Our transfer history, our university articulations, placing underserved populations, some of the most respected programs across the country, including Cooper Union, Pratt, Auburn, Syracuse, as well as, of course, our local schools and partners, USC, Woodbury, SciArc, Pomona, SLO, uh, it, it, it speaks for itself. Our curriculum is composed of some 35 courses in design and theory, technology and professional practice, digital design and fabrication, and of course we integrate this. We have a, in some ways a more vast curriculum than some of our universities do. We have five full-time professors. We're all AIA members, got to put the plug in, we're in an AIA event. We have two full-time instructional aides and we have 12 adjunct professors that come from a very uh, uh, wide uh, perspective of the profession. We have an emeritus student advisor, one of the founders of SciArc. We have a full fabrication digital and analog model shop. We have dual enrollment, uh, four local high schools, including uh, uh, Hollywood STEM, Ingalil. We actually have two classes on that campus. See, another thing that we share together. Um, we have uh, uh, partnerships uh, with USC who embed some student teachers with our instructors. Our instructors that we have at the high school uh, courses, by the way, are former students. They're the ambassadors for our program. They're the ambassadors for the architecture. And that's how we get the next generation in recruitment. We have extracurricular activities. It's two, it, it, I should have done this a lot sooner. One of the things that's really elevated us and pushed us, when you do what we do in our community, 
it's important for our community to know that we're not isolated, we're not balkanized. And I've been wanting to push our success to a greater community. And that has included uh, you know, the African-American community. Where or what school in, in, in South Central Los Angeles and any other uh, uh, areas of saturation, do they have a school that can provide them a pathway, an economic pathway, and of course, one that helps with their uh, giving them a, a fair shot at, at being successful at this. And if they, if they don't have it, then we need to go to them. And so NOMA has been a partnership that I'm very proud of. And with our NOMA partnership, we're the hosts of their pipeline and their fall uh, uh, series. We now have a, obviously a NOMA student uh, club as well. And with me tonight, uh, Stephen Curtis is, is the VP of that. We also have a USGBC. We have a relationship with the AIA. We compete in competitions and exhibits, AIA 2x8, obviously this event. Congratulations to two of our students for being recognized and winning uh, awards. Uh, SLL Design Village and other. We were very competitive and we want to compete at the university programs. We're not competing at the high school and junior college ones. We have a lecture series. So we bring in a diverse number of speakers, both representing uh, 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 different uh, genres of, of work and as well as, as themselves. We have a dedicated college counselor we developed for our college. We travel, we, we have a two week uh, event or two week uh, travel to Europe every winter and we have a one week event to Chicago every summer. We have an advisory board that's made up of all the universities. We have architectural firms on our advisory board. I see Pam Tushner here, she's from DLR. That gives you an example of one of those that is involved in our, in our school. Uh, we have government entities, and we have an annual scholarship luncheon at the end of the year, which we raise over $50,000 a year alone to uh, give to our students and allocate that to our students. So in closing, um, I know we always have room to, to, to better ourselves, and uh, we can do that as, as our influence allows us to maybe expand um, our resources and, and our success we learn more from others. And it's always been about the synergy. You know, we have an interesting Asia, uh, international Asian um, contingency in our, in our program, which really creates an interesting learning environment. And so with that, um, Stephen, I guess I'm waiting for you and your, your magic question. For sure, for sure. Um, well said, Professor Hamner. Um, let's see, let's see. So our first question is, uh, how do you support students who are having difficulty getting materials for their design projects due to the pandemic? I'm worried that maybe a student asked this and we haven't been able to take care of them. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. You know, I, I have a little bit of what we call a, uh, a hidden stash in our program. Uh, part of it has been uh, HMC. Uh, I know I understand. I just read something with Woodbury. They received a the bridge grant about ten thousand dollars. I think I received one too as well last year. And uh, you know that's our, kind of our rainy day money, and it's used. I never could have imagined we'd be in this situation. And so we we will buy the necessary material we need. And, and I have a, one of my staff members is on this this uh, is in the audience here tonight as well. And. He makes it his personal endeavor to go and meet at neutral places, or we set up a, a spot, a drop-off spot, meeting all the COVID-19 protocol, and we get the material to our students. Um, that's part of you know, what we have to do to be successful here. This is that, again, the support. This is where they trust us. And, um, and, and I don't know if I've answered that as, as, as simply as I could, um, but we, we, we reach out. We, that's part of what we do. Thank you. I, I think that was a really good um, question for you to ask Stephen, um, something that I'm sure many universities are thinking about right now. Um, so thank you both um, for representing ELAC and um, we're going to move on to the next school. We have two more to go. Um, so up next we have USC and representing the architecture program there is the Associate Professor of Practice, es Esther Mar Margulies, and also we have a current student, Byron Wonk. Thank you very much, Joshua, for uh, including your alma mater in this great program. I'm sure we weren't your first choice, maybe, but here, anyway, uh, we're actually our dean is about on the verge of, of 
posting and publishing his statement on anti-racism and equity. So I will stay out of the policy side of this and talk to you only about the practice about what we have been doing over the last few years. We are on a multi-year trajectory to educate and empower our students to take on issues of racial and social inequity through scholarship and practice. We're developing a culture of citizen architects to encourage all students to see equity as their professional and civic duty. We began these efforts to address inequities in our own school in 2018 when we crafted a five-year strategic plan to increase DEI resources and impact across the entirety of our school, including students, faculty, and staff. And so far, I want to let you know where we are seeing success. We have increased the diversity of our undergraduate student body. Our Latinx population is very close to reflecting the demographics of our region. But we, like other programs, are extremely low in Black American uh, demographics. We're increasing our first generation college students. We have a significant number of first gen students coming from local high schools and admitted as transfers. Thank you, ELAC, uh, and other two-year schools for helping us find them. We've worked this fall to develop a more targeted outreach effort to find underrepresented minority applicants. We're in the process of developing a high school program with LAUSD juniors. It's a pipeline program similar to the Michigan and ARC prep programs, and this will also bring in young BIPOC faculty as teaching fellows. We're increasing our faculty diversity. We've hired six tenure, tenure track faculty in the past three years. Five of them are women and three are people of color. We're working on student inclusion, course content diversification and staff equity issues. Last year, or last spring, when some of our students experienced financial impacts from COVID, we pulled together an emergency support and funds for exactly those kinds of, especially studio related and technology uh, emergencies. We started this fall a school-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion Slack channel to share DEI resources and events across the entire school. We've had an incredible diversity out uh, and outreach in our lecture series with speakers who have inspired all of our school disciplines. We're currently working with the Getty on programs to share the Paul R. Williams archives. We've invited people like Josh Foster to talk to our students this fall about the importance of democracy and voting in the recent election. In the past three years, we have celebrated International Women's Day, focused on wiki entries for women architect and designers. This year, we will engage our students in research on Black American architects and designers. Following the events of last summer, our students responded with a well-crafted, thoughtful student plan developed by our SAWA AI AIAS and NOMAS groups that focused on inclusion of BIPOC and LGBTQ plus voices in work, hiring more BIPOC women and LGBTQ faculty and staff, mandating diversity training for all students, faculty and staff, which is in development by the university, creating accountability for toxic learning environments, providing financial support for students who are in need, and reaching out and engaging utner represented voices in the field of architecture. So those are just, you know, not 100% of everything we're doing, but a lot of the things that we have been and are continuing to do. And Byron, give it your best shot. Ask me a good question. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Byron from the USC chap uh, UC chapter of NOMAS. And so the question I have for today is, what lessons has USC architecture learned from the recent Marshall School of Business episode where Dean Jeffrey Garrett told Professor Greg Patton from the course and brought negative national press coverage to the university. How does USC architecture sensitively cater to the needs of one racial group without disenfranchi disenfranchising another? And how do you balance the weight of all the voices and perspectives in the room? Thanks for, uh, I really appreciate that we had some excellent questions coming from our student body and luckily uh, notoriety is something that we're used to at USC. Uh, and we've learned, you know, not to be embarrassed, but to move forward and to respond. And I have to say that many of our faculty are were heard about this, read about it in the LA Times as usual, or across the school vibrations. And uh, it has really, it, it was a, a wake up call to our faculty. It has increased awareness of inherent bias. 
an implicit bias. It has made our faculty much more aware of their choice of language and content, which has very different potential impacts on students from different backgrounds and cultures. And we have to educate ourselves. I mean, awareness alone is not enough, but it is a first step in dismantling bias and, and racism. We actually, one of the ways that we're responding to this in the School of Architecture is we dedicated time to this topic in our recent fall faculty retreat. We asked all attending faculty to discuss a wide variety of examples of microaggressions and implicit bias that have or could occur in our school to widen our understanding across the spectrum of our student population and to formulate action. And I just want to mention one other thing, which is you know, really the student plan of action that I mentioned that was developed this summer. Our student organizations, SAWA, AIAS, and NOMAS have been extremely productive and helpful in helping us to respond as faculty. This fall in their one of the introductory architecture courses, they developed um, a policy and guidelines for establishing a safe space and space of respect that said this, this course and its virtual lectures and meetings is a space of empathy and safety. Virtual, virtual lectures and meetings is a space where diverse thoughts and feelings are valid and should be respected. We all hold biases and sometimes we don't even know they exist in us. This is okay, we are all people and doing the best we can. There is a limit to all of our knowledge, students, faculty, CAs included, and we're going to make mistakes, especially regarding cultures and ideas that are less familiar to all of us. That is okay. We are here to learn from each other. And I'll actually stop there. There were a few more points, but I thought this was incredibly productive on the student parts to recognize that we all have weakness and that we should be bold and we should go out and be diverse and learn together. Very, very good question, Byron. You definitely packed in a real, real good one for your one there. So thank you. And thank you, Esther, for, for the great answers. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, we have Otis. And so representing Otis, we have um, the Chair of Architecture, Landscape and Interiors, Linda, Linda Pilari. Um, unfortunately, we do not have um, the student uh, member Trayvon Washington today, but Linda will be able to take on um, the question. Thank you, Josh, and uh, thank you everyone for this, uh, and 2 by 8 and AIA for this. And I think what we're witnessing right now is, right now is exclusion on Trayvon's part. You know, it's actually, we're, we're sort of living it where he's had internet, in, you know, connectivity problems in his home environment. And I suspect and fear that may be what happened here. So um, we're a very small, I have a very small department under 50 students in a very small school under 12, um, 1200 students. So um, I'll first address what we can do in the department and then what I really need the, the college to do and what the college is doing. So of course within, within our department, um, I've been trying to for several years to address uh, programs that are not, not uh, sort of privileged programs, but the unfortunate events and um, sort of uh, situation that we're in now actually helped me in forcing all studio courses that are addressing diversity in their context and programs. So framing and jumpstarting the focus of the discourse on inequities and disenfranchisement. So in our Studio 5, they're doing a tuition-free community college for the arts with room and board for financially qualifying students. And the, the juniors are designing a community center and learning pod preschool for disenfranchised communities. It allows parents to work while children are safe and learning. And the students chose their own site and community in Los Angeles for this project. So there was multiple sort of um, conversations about those communities. Second project for the juniors is a teen LGBTQ homeless shelter. Um, all history and theory courses decolonize their texts and precedents. This is ongoing work. Um, I have to ask the faculty to do it. You know, we have to stay on top of it. And then what happens is, is, as we unfortunately, you've got this really loaded program and site, and we should have all this conversation. And then the architects get in there and talk about 
disciplinary issues and form and whatever. So we, we have to keep the conversation, you know, try to keep the conversation of what we've loaded it with. Um, uh, our students, architecture, landscape, and tier students, a small group joined the NOMA in September. I joined it, joined it as well. And they are close to completing bylaws for their NOMA student chapter. And there will be an Otis NOMAS club necessary. Um, they're very close. So we're just adding the kind of financial stuff structure at the end. They're designing their own logo. I presented the DEI, now a small department. I presented the DEI challenge to Otis's DEI council, which I'll mention later, because I need the college to support this. Um, 125 under, of the 160 points I can't do. It cannot be addressed at a department level you know, a very small department in a small college. So what is the college doing? So um, just coincidentally, when all this stuff came down, we had a new president that started in April. We have a new provost that started in July. We actually have a new financial VP that started like, you know, last March. So everybody's new, but the president, everybody jumped on board. Um, with a number of initiatives. Um, we created a diversity, equity, and inclusion council. It's led by Karen Hill, our VP of Human Resources and Development. So their charges are going to inventory current DEI efforts at the college. They created their charter, of course. And they created a DEI statement that will guide the college. Now that's, they created that. It was distributed to everybody, faculty and staff. Uh, students as well for input in the last month. Um, and that included a working draft of Otis's 10 points of standing up for equity. And I'm gonna just really quickly summarize them. Um, it's, we do not tolerate racism or any other form of violence or discrimination, dismantle systems of oppression, recognize the college's historical struggles around equity, recognizing diversity. We commit to identity, and dignity and respect, we commit to responsibility to redress unjust histories, commit to correcting inequities, commit to hold one another accountable. We commit to honesty, vulnerability, and openness as we do this, and commit to an intersectional and justice-oriented approach. Um, Otis's uh, college's new DEI website should launch before 20, next year, within the next month. Um, there will be an external and objective audit of the College on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And uh, an important thing, a new executive position at the vice president level has been created. There's a search committee is at work. It was formed and it's at work selecting candidates and we should have that VP position at Otis by February. Um, we will have mandatory anti-racism training for all students, faculty, staff, and trustees. Um, the college has identified several platforms and courses for this, but we're waiting for, we'll let the, the VP, uh, the DEI VP choose this. Prior to the start of the semester, the college created the Black Creatives Institute for incoming Black identified students to build community and support personal growth, identity, cultural and career development. They've continued with monthly meetings. Um, and for me, and well, all of this is incredibly important, but I think really very concrete things have happened in our admissions office. They added Otis diversity, diversity scholarships to support underrepresented students specifically. Um, and here's where we, and I'm sure many certainly private colleges have suffered or, or not suffered or, or been incorrect, missing, missing the boat. Um, we are now adding 50 local diverse schools to our outreach list. Private schools office reached out to international student population, as opposed to looking at our, our own city and the communities within our own city. But Otis is doing that now. Um, we're supporting, admissions is supporting students who have less access to art and design classes at the high school level by adjusting the portfolio requirement and mentoring students on producing them. And 
modified the liberal studies transfer credit acceptance policies to attract more community college transfers and their diverse populations. We're offering admissions and financial services appointments in Spanish, offering Spanish language assistance and question submission at virtual events and students now submit their pronouns on an online application and on their preferred name form. So that's, those are the things the colleges are doing. And I hope that the college is going to support the department, you know, even though the, the, the NOMA's DEI challenge is architecture, those uh, initiatives and goals cross all of our disciplines, of course. And I think the college is going to you know, support us in this and sign on. And that's, that's my goal in that regard. Um, fortunately, Trayvon not here, um, I could, uh, uh, I'll do a quickie, one of his questions. How does your department plan to ensure that your work as DEI advocates is sustainable? Um, uh, I have to do it. That's how I say, it's like my department, it's me. So it's up to me, I have to keep, but with the college behind these, having very concrete efforts and keeping the, the discourse happening, the DEI council, is um, going to set up and, and did this fall set up a forum every semester for the entire community to come together, discuss these issues and have breakout sessions, which was really interesting. 200 people trying to do breakout sessions. It didn't quite work. We, <laughs> we got, it took a little while to get our little breakout teams together, but it was a, a great discussion. We had one in September and I'm sure we'll do one in the spring semester. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so we thank all of you for sharing um, sharing all of the things that your your colleges and universities are doing um, and the great questions. Um, to to wrap it up, um, we want to still give time to to our special guest that we have, um, Professor Bradford Grant. Um, a quick a quick bio on Professor Grant um, is he's a professor of architecture at Howard University out in Washington, D.C. He has been in leadership roles at Hampton and Howard University as chairperson, director, associate dean, and interim dean. Brad is past president of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, a former board member of NOMA, past chair of the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., and current board president of the Center for Contemplative Mind in Society. So we're very happy to have him here um, to share his invaluable experience teaching at an HBCU, also after growing up in the California Bay Area in the state that doesn't have any HBCU architecture programs. So we thank you very much. And we know you're East Coaster, so we really appreciate you staying up till this, till this late, late time. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to uh, be able to join uh, this, uh, this group. Very, very uh, number of very good uh, uh, proposals and directions and actions that, that I think um, will bode well for our uh, work in this, in this area. Uh, by the way, Joshua, California did uh, propose to have an HBCU in uh, the historic black community of Allensworth, California in 1914. Wow. Uh, but, the, but the California governor and legislator at having a black university in California. And that really brings me to, there's three points I wanted to point out and I, I wanna share my screen. Give me a chance to load up and share my uh, screen. Uh, that brings me uh, to the point of this idea of history. Uh, the HBCUs, of course, has this history that, that focuses on the, the connection to the Black experience. And that becomes very important. And, it, and they have always, even from the beginning, had a, a kind of a service orientation. This is a, a photograph of the Hampton uh, Trade School, which the School of Architecture uh, uh, was founded in. And, and the HBCUs, the historic black colleges and universities uh, were really some of the first um, design Sorry, build Sorry, we can't see your program. screen actually. Are, are you sharing something? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, no worries, um, I just wanna make sure we get the content. Um, can you okay. try again please? Yeah, let me try again. Uh, 
Well, okay. I won't share a screen. But, but let me back up and say that, that the HBCUs were the uh, first uh, uh, design build programs uh, in, our, in our country. And so this idea of really having a focus to, to the uh, Black experience becomes important. But I think one of the lessons that we can learn here is this idea of history. I think in each of your programs, uh, there needs to be a, a, a really a close look at your history, both the good and the bad history, the name of your buildings, the name of your plazas, and what does that mean? What, and, and how does that, uh, uh, and is there acknowledgement that needs to happen? Is there any repair that needs to happen? Or even an apology? Now, many, you, there's many universities, mostly in the East Coast and the South, that have done these kind of uh, acknowledgement of their of their past racial uh, injustices and, and history, but it, I think that's a really good starting point um, that we might happen that that you might have. Uh, again, the HBCUs generally have this history that is well connected to to the uh, Black experience. But the second point is this idea of safe space, creating safe space. And, and it sounds like many of your policies are really about creating uh, uh, these trusted places, these safe spaces where, where folks can, uh, and students and faculty can really have a place that they can feel comfortable with and can be empowered to grow uh, in the program. Again, the HBCUs provide that safe space, especially for the African American students, right? Part of the, the reasons that we can provide what I call the safe space is because we have people that look like them that are teaching them, that are administrating them, that are staffing them, and that are go going to school with them. So this idea of uh, uh, outreach, certainly in, in the faculty, uh, the uh, ACSA statistics has it that 44% of the accredited uh, schools of architecture have no African American full time tenure track faculty. That's, that's tragic. And again, the HBCUs are, are the reverse of that. Um, there's there's uh, seven HBCUs with accredited architecture programs out of 139 accredited program. So uh, the HBCUs represent a, approximately 5% of all the accredited programs, but we, we graduate upwards to over 30% of the African American uh, architecture students and, and are responsible for over 30% of, of the registered architects in the United States. So there's, there's this kind of uh, reversal that needs to happen. The, the other uh, hundred and 30 schools need to do more efforts uh, in that in that area. And then and then the third point I wanted to, to state is this idea is unity and diversity. And we have all been talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but this idea of having a, a diverse number of students and faculty to create a critical mass. So, so some of you are saying I have one or two, three or four African American students. That makes it very, very difficult, and and there really needs to be a critical mass. Again, the HBCUs, of course, have that critical mass, and it has that diversity. Many people are surprised that uh, within that uh, a student population, we have students from Africa, from the Caribbean, from Brazil, from uh, from uh, most of the African diaspora. Uh, in the world, uh, you'll find that the, uh, at the HBCUs, um, oh, the HBCUs, the seven HBCUs will uh, have what we call an annual forum, where we have all the schools gather in one place and really, really talk about issues that uh, reflect their experiences and their, and their background. And I'm always surprised that uh, given that we have a large pool of African-American students. Many of the HBC programs only have the undergraduate bachelor's degree. Why do I not see any or few of the graduate programs in architecture, outreach and common recruit 
at these HBCUs. There's a large pool. So it, it, it irks me when, when folks say, well, the pool of African-American students, certainly graduate students are small. Uh, no, that's not you're, not, you're you're at the shallow end of the pool. <laughs> There's the deep end that, that many uh, universities have an approach. That also goes for uh, faculty members. Um, uh, 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 the HBCUs have uh, Florida A&M University, Hampton and Howard uh, instituted several years ago uh, in incubation or incubator program to develop uh, future faculty uh, with the graduate programs and the graduate students for we would develop uh, uh, young folks and, and have them go through training and, and hire them as adjuncts and eventually incubate them uh, for professorships. Uh, we didn't get any of the primarily or, or predominantly white institution to buy into those programs, right? Um, they always wanted experience, top uh, uh, number of years of experience and so on before they would even consider hiring many of our African-American young uh, graduates as students. And, and so um, I'm always surprised that there's not more interest uh, in trying to um, join in or, or reinvigorate this incubator program to develop more Black professors and instructors. Um, and so there's a number of, of programs that the HBCUs have, have been doing, have been going, uh, that could be uh, somewhat of an aid to the number of other schools that are grappling with programs of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, I'm going to stop there and allow, you know, if there's any time left for questions to, to, to proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was that was really good. And I think it, it is really good for all of us here um, on, on on the West Coast to start to learn learn more about what these great programs are doing. Me being an East Coast native myself, I grew up hearing about all the programs and HBCUs. And when I came out here, I realized that it's just not it's not something that's so readily readily available. Um, and it needs to be a, a pipeline definitely needs, needs to happen. So thank you very much. Um, we've had a very great discussion today, um, very great topics, questions, and, and ideas shared by everyone. Um, for the sake of time, we will not have much time for a Q&A. If there is a burning question that someone wants to ask, we have time for one. But if not, um, we would like to wrap it up um, and pass it over to Tatiana. So if there's someone, raise your hand and let me know. If not, thank you very much. And we hope this is not the last discussion we'll have about this. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to push forward um, these, these initiatives. And no burning questions. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I know we, we went way over, but honestly, I think this was like such a wonderful discussion to have and very, necessary and we're um, very grateful to provide this platform for you guys. Um, I'd like to thank everyone involved, um, Josh for moderating all our schools, um, instructors and uh, student participants. Um, Grant, thank you very much for uh, staying up this late. Um, Chuck, thank you for representing 2 by 8 and of course our committee, this would not have been possible. We've had quite a year um, and I think Key, some key takeaways from this um, discussion is the visibility and the um, awareness that it all uh, produced, right? Um, it was great to see specifics that each college talked about that they're doing. Um, and I think some of the ways I'm thinking on how we can continue this conversation is um, maybe creating this platform was, was our way um, but I, I don't know what that'll look like in the, like creating a, a task force or um, something to keep up this dialogue. Um, and I think specificity is key. Uh, everyone, we can be very vague with saying we want to um, create diversity and, and equity and, and all of that, but what does that really look like? And I think some of the things I heard was um, 
I was taking notes the whole time because it was just all very interesting. Um, but how you take it to a student level and how um, you actually let them speak and you hear them and um, just, I don't know, I have so many comments, <laughs> but I know we're so behind on time. Um, I think if you guys have any additional questions, comments, concern, anything like reach out to AIA, reach out to any of us. Um, uh, I think we'd love to really uh, carry on this dialogue with all of you. Um, if there's anything specific you think we can do, uh, we're always open to that. You know, this is the first time um, we've had a panel discussion like this one, um, and it was in conjunction with our two by exhibition. Um, and so we're always open to like furthering this dialogue with you all. Um, so it's way past East Coast bedtimes, I'm sorry. Uh, but thank you, thank you all for participating. Um, we really appreciate it. I think this was wonderful. Thank you for organizing this. This was well lovely. Yeah. Let, let's let's continue the, the vulnerability, I think, in architecture. Let's continue the awareness, the transparency on top level, like down to the bottom. I think that's really important. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good Thank night. You. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you all for participating. Great job, everybody. All right. Jack, I'm going to end the meeting. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Corinne. Really good job. This is, it was a lot to put together. So great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and I'll follow up with everybody tomorrow with the links for both. I'll just include everybody on, on both of them. Why That's not? Great. Right? Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Sorry about the. <laughs> The lockout incident. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you're home. Yeah, I got in before six, so it's all good. <laughs> Bye.